Tonight's guest speaker has, as you've read in your uh, folder on your table, has had a fierce determination to help women in need. It was this desire that led her to a career with Planned Parenthood. She rapidly came to the top of the, the chain as a director in uh, under eight years, but um, that desire that she had to help women was the same thing that motivated her to quickly flee Planned Parenthood. And of course, you know Planned Parenthood uh, is the nation's largest abortion provider. Uh, she is the author of Unplanned, and here to tell her amazing story is Abby Johnson. So howdy. howdy! It's good to be here with all of you tonight. I love South Carolina. I tell my husband if there was anywhere else I was going to live besides Texas, which we're never leaving, but if we did, it would be South Carolina. I absolutely love it here. Nice and southern, and the tea is always sweet. So um, I, I wanted to start out by just kind of telling you a story, something that's happening in our life right now. Um, my very best friend lives in Maryland, and she is a uh, sign language interpreter. And she interprets for, she's a volunteer interpreter at her church. There's a large deaf community uh, in, the, in the city where she lives, and, and a lot of them come to her church. And so she interprets there. About five months ago, she called me and said, you know, one of the gals um, that I interpret for is pregnant I don't really know a lot about the situation, but um, she went to her local pregnancy center, and because she wasn't going to have an abortion, they told her that they wouldn't be able to help her. And she had a lot of needs, and so she had asked some of her friends if we would be willing to, uh, you know, give her some gift cards, help her in a financial way, and so, you know, of course, we said sure, and so... About five months ago, we sent uh, some money to this woman who we did not know. I'd never met her before in my life. Three weeks ago, uh, I got a phone call from my friend in Maryland. Now, uh, we have four children, my husband and I. We have an eight-year-old daughter, and then we have three sons, uh, two and a half, one and a half, and a half. <laughs> and, uh, I know, it's, I know. We know how it happens. Thing. Um, <laughs> we even have a TV. It's amazing. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I tell people we became pro-life and we couldn't stop breeding. So that's, that's what happens when you say yes to God. But um, so anyway, we knew that it was in our heart that we wanted, from the very beginning of our marriage, we knew that one day we would want to expand our family through adoption, but particularly adoption through the foster care system. There's about 200,000 children in our, in our uh, country's foster care system who are looking for forever families. And we felt very strongly that that, that would be a way that we would eventually expand our family. But we were thinking maybe in a year, since my youngest is only six months, and that's given that I don't get pregnant again. So, which you never know. <laughs> um, so that's the first question, actually, my in-laws always ask, are you pregnant? Every time they see me, I don't know. So, um, I'm good friends with Michelle and uh, Jim Bob Duggar, and I said, we're coming for you. Just watch. So anyway, um, so, okay, so my friend calls me three weeks ago, and she says, hey, Abby, you know, um, and we talk just about every day, but um, I could tell she had, a, she had an agenda with this phone call, and she said, hey, she said, I know that, you know, you guys, you talk about adopting and everything, when, you know, when do you think you're kind of looking at, at being really serious about adopting? And I said, oh, I don't know, probably in about a year. And she said, oh, yeah, okay. Um, what do you think about two weeks? 
And I sat there for a minute and I said, well, okay. And then I thought, I better call my husband. <laughs> so, my husband's a stay-at-home dad, so really he needed to be consulted in this. So, um, so I, called, I called my husband and actually, yeah, I did call him. I said, did I text him? No, I actually think I called him. I wanted to text him. But anyway, um, I was on the road doing an event, so all this was happening through phone. So uh, I called him and I said, hey, listen, um, so Chris called and she has a baby uh, that she needs us to adopt. And I said yes. And um, he might have cussed. And then he freaked out for about mm, 24 hours. And then I just kind of let him, you know. And then he called me back the next morning and he said, you know, we've got to do this. I've prayed about it and we've got to do it. So the more we found out about the situation, the more heartbreaking it actually became. You see, this little boy uh, was not conceived in a loving relationship. And um, he is uh, biracial. His father is African American, his mom is Caucasian. And this woman, this, this mother, had actually been involved with an adoptive family. Um, like I said, the, the the mother is deaf, and this adoptive family three weeks ago sent her an email and said, you know, we've decided that since there is a, a small possibility that your baby could be deaf, we don't want it. And so another adoptive family was called who was home study ready, and something was mentioned about the baby being biracial, and the couple's question was, well, how black is the dad? So that was obviously not a fit. And so then we were called. And having a six-month-old child at home, I'm sure everybody thought we were crazy when we said that we were going to adopt this baby, but I figured that if we are a people of life, when that call comes, we better say yes. And so our son, Jude, well, I, I have set him up for the rest of his life to hear that Beatles song. Um, <laughs> but uh, Jude, we, we decide on Jude because uh, first, the uh, birth mother has three children and all of their names start with J, and so we wanted to continue that with, with our adopted son. And also, um, I'm Catholic, I think I'm the only one here. Um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> it's trickery, right there. It's... All right, so, okay. Um, and St. Jude uh, is the patron saint of impossible causes, or desperate causes. And we thought that that fit the situation perfectly. And so our son, Jude, was born last Thursday. He's eight days old. And um, we are, I'm actually being held prisoner right now in the snowy state of Maryland. Um, because we have to wait until both Maryland and Texas approve the interstate contract before we can, uh, we can go home to Texas. And so uh, I am here. I flew my mom up to Maryland. My mom, of course, had no problem flying up there to stay with her new grandson. Um, so my mom is up there with him so that I could be here with you. And, um, you know, as much as I would love to tell you that I've always been this advocate of adoption and, and life and the gospel of life, that has not always been the case for me, and you know that. That's why I'm here. I worked for Planned Parenthood for eight years of my life. I was a clinic director. I would like to share with you that that I had a lot of internal, internal 
angst and turmoil about what I did at Planned Parenthood, but I did not. I loved my job. I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was doing the right thing for women. I thought I was helping women. I thought I was helping them control their, their reproductive freedom. So I didn't know anything about Planned Parenthood when I got involved. I got involved as a college student. Uh, I tell people that wherever vulnerable women are, so is Planned Parenthood. And there are tens of thousands of vulnerable women on our college campuses across the country. And you better believe that Planned Parenthood is right there with them. And so when I was introduced to Planned Parenthood, I didn't know anything about the organization, had never gone to a Planned Parenthood before, didn't know anything about them, but this woman was on my campus. I went to Texas A&M University. Okay, crickets. And, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the support. And um, so, man, I'm a Catholic and an Aggie. I am like, like a foreigner here in this. Um. So anyway, um, but I was on campus one day, met a woman with Planned Parenthood. She was trying to recruit volunteers and certainly clients and maybe people that could eventually come on as staff. And so when she asked me what I knew about Planned Parenthood, and I said, you know, I really don't know anything, she started telling me about all of these amazing services that Planned Parenthood offers. I mean, all this health care they provide, and they do it for free. And I just thought, that is so sweet. And so she started asking me what I thought about abortion, and I, you know, I said, well, gosh, I don't know. I was, you know, I was raised pro-life. I was raised in a Christian home. And she said, oh, that's great. But, you know, see, these pro-lifers, they're good people, but they're just, they're just kind of misguided. You guys are misguided. And um, she said, you know, they just don't see the big picture. They don't see that without legalized abortion, women would be forced to go where? The back alleys, right? And what happens there? Oh, women will just be just falling out, dying all over the street from these illegal abortions. And she told me that at Planned Parenthood anyway, it's like just a little teeny tiny percentage, just a little bit of what they do, no big deal, like 3%. And she said at Planned Parenthood, they didn't want women to choose abortion, but it was just kind of like a necessary evil. It was just something that, that had to happen. It was just an option that had to be there for women, but that their goal was to actually reduce the abortion numbers. And I didn't know any better. It all sounded good to me. So I signed up to be a volunteer that day, and I started volunteering that, that Saturday, and that was it. Once I was in, I was in. See, it was what I didn't know about Planned Parenthood. That's what got me in trouble. So when she told me that Planned Parenthood, gosh, they're the only people around to help these poor, low-income women. See, I didn't know that that wasn't true. There's currently fewer than 700 Planned Parenthood facilities in the United States. There are over 10,000 federally qualified health centers, rural public health centers, and hospital systems that will see women, men, and children who are low-income, not to mention the over 2,000 pregnancy resource centers that will help women through their pregnancy and after. So I didn't know that. When she told me that, you know, Planned Parenthood, gosh, we don't like abortion, it's just a little bit of what we do. So I didn't know that that 3% actually equaled 330,000 abortions every year. And when she talked about these back alley abortions, and you know, I, gosh, I didn't know that what took place in the back alleys was really no different than what takes place inside of our safe and legal abortion clinics today. And when she told me that we were there to liberate and empower women, see, I didn't know part of that liberation and empowerment would mean selling abortions to girls as young as 10. I didn't know that it would be providing a safe haven for those who abuse these young girls. Covering up abuse of young women. So I didn't know that's what they meant when they said they liberated women. People
people ask me all the time, Abby, how is it that you went from being this good Christian kid, this kid that was raised in this, this amazing parent, amazing parents. We were in church every Sunday, every Wednesday, youth camp, youth choir, all of that. How is it that you went from somebody that was like that to being someone who ran an abortion clinic? How did you go from being that kid to being a person that laid on an abortion clinic table not once but twice to take the life of my own children? How did that happen? I don't have a silver bullet answer for you except to say that it happened just a little bit at a time. Because that's the way that sin works in our lives. It's just that one moment. You allow that one moment of sin to enter your life, to enter your heart, to enter your mind, and you can become a person that you don't even know. People say, oh, Abby, I, oh, I, I, I could never have an abortion. Yes, you could. Oh, Abby, I, oh, I don't know how you did that. I could never work in an abortion clinic. Yes, you could. All it takes is that one moment of sin. And that one moment can spiral out of control. And you can do things and be involved in situations. And it seems like it's not even who you are. But while I know that Satan has to be kind of sneaky to do his dirty work. I know that when God wants to change your life, it can happen like that. And that's what happened for me September 26, 2009. I was asked to assist in an ultrasound-guided abortion procedure. Ultrasounds are generally not used during an abortion procedure. They are used prior to the abortion being done because... Uh, we wanted to find out exactly how far along the woman was in her pregnancy so that we would know how much to charge her for the abortion. But then after the gestational dating is done, the ultrasound is rolled away, and abortion in our country is done in a blind manner. So a, a physician, maybe a physician, maybe not, has a, an instrument called a cannula. That is like a tube, like a, a little straw. And that's what's hooked up to the suction machine. And, and the physician takes that cannula and he blindly probes in and out of the woman's uterus until he thinks he has enough blood and tissue in a glass jar. That glass jar goes through a little turnstile, will pass through that's in the wall. And on the other side of that wall, there's a lab called the POC lab. And what does POC stand for? Products of Conception. What's that? It's the baby, right? You can't say baby inside of an abortion clinic. So we would say POC or POP, or uh, if the staff was feeling funny, they would say it stood for pieces of children. And inside that POC lab, there is someone who is tasked to be a POC technician, and their job is to take everything inside of that glass jar, dump it into a dish, and reassemble the parts of the baby that were aborted. Why did we do that? Because if we left a hand or a part of the spine or the head inside a woman's uterus, she could develop a very serious infection that could be fatal to her. Now, I was a POC technician. I was trained to do this. I cannot explain to you how I was able to reassemble parts of babies and not be bothered enough to run out the front door except to say that spiritual blindness is very real. And so when I was asked to assist in this different type of abortion procedure, this ultrasound-guided abortion procedure, I was interested. I thought this would be a good learning opportunity for me. We had a different physician that was down, and he was explaining to me that this might be shocking, but it's actually safer if a doctor can see what he's doing while he's performing surgery on someone. And so he was going to show me what this looked like, and... The time came, I was asked to come in and assist. My job during the abortion was to hold the ultrasound probe on the woman's abdomen so that the doctor would be able to, in his words, visualize his target. 
And so I just want to be clear, I'm not a doctor or a nurse. I'm not an ultrasonographer. I don't have any certification in that. Uh, I'm a therapist, so if you're having a bad day, we can talk about it. But um, if you need any type of invasive medical procedure, I'm really not your gal. Uh, but see, inside the abortion industry, they don't care. You just have to be willing and go through about a one-hour in-house training class and they'll set you loose to perform medical procedures on women. And I had gone through that training. I was certainly qualified in their eyes. And so we did the measurement. We found out that the baby was 13 weeks along. Now, 13 weeks, are there arms and legs? Fingers and toes? Brain waves? Heartbeat? Internal organs? Yeah, everything's there. Everything needed for a human being to grow and develop and live outside of the womb is already present and rapidly developing at 13 weeks. And so I remember looking at the ultrasound screen and thinking, wow, it really looks like a baby. I mean, I know it's not because the parent had told me it's not. Now, my daughter's eight. I've only been, I've only been out of the industry um, a little over five years. So uh, I, I was pregnant and, and had my daughter while I worked at Planned Parenthood. Now, when I was pregnant with my daughter, and when I started having ultrasounds with her at six weeks, she was a baby. You know, my baby was a baby at six weeks, at three weeks, at 12 weeks. But I guess she was a baby because she was wanted. If the baby was unwanted, it was just POC or tissue, something to be discarded. And so I, I was looking at that ultrasound, I was actually remembering the, the ultrasound that I had with my daughter Grace and feeling a little apprehensive, feeling a little anxious, but reminding myself that no matter what, no matter what, this baby, this tissue, this POC was not going to feel anything. Now let me speak to that for a minute. See, women would come into my clinic and the, the Number one question I would get asked was, will my baby feel this? Because you see what we've done, and we've even done it in the pro-life movement. We have somehow equated humanity to pain. It's all these pain-capable bills that are floating around. See, we have confused the public, and we've even confused ourselves into believing that if a child feels pain, there is a greater sense of urgency to save that baby. Instead of recognizing that humanity begins at conception and is actually the same amount of humanity at conception as a baby that's 30 weeks in the womb. And so, see what's happened now in Montana, there's some pro-life legislators that, with all this pain-capable distraction that's going on, they've actually introduced a bill that continues to allow abortion after 20 weeks as long as the baby receives an analgesic so that they won't feel the death in the womb. See, this is the dangerous road that we tread when we start to make decisions on what babies have humanity and what babies don't. What babies are worth saving more than other babies? And so because we are confused about it, these women who came in to our clinic. They were confused about it and they would ask us this question and we had a scripted response that we were to give back to these women and the scripted response that I gave back thousands of times was, no, the fetus has no sensory development or does not feel anything until 28 weeks. Now, do you believe that? No. Well, I did. I mean, I knew better and these women, they knew better too. 60% of women that have abortions already have children at home. 
not dealing with a group of people that don't know what it's like to be pregnant, that don't know that they're having a baby. They know they're having a baby. But what we've done in our society is that we have convinced women that if your baby is going to be born into a less than perfect situation, the most compassionate thing to do, the most merciful thing to do, is to take that baby's life. Why? Because we are so afraid of suffering in our nation. I mean, that's why we have this culture of death. Right? Because we don't want to suffer. Ooh, if a baby could possibly suffer as it's growing up, well, let's kill it. Ooh, you have a bad, you have a, a bad diagnosis, brain cancer, ooh, let's just go ahead and kill you. Oh, you're really elderly, oh, your quality of life is low, we don't want you to suffer, we'll just go ahead and euthanize you. Everything, all of this culture of death that we're saturated in, revolves around the fact that we do not want to suffer. Instead of taking our suffering joyfully and having that suffering draw us nearer to the cross of Christ, instead of using that opportunity to draw near to Christ, we say, we don't want to suffer, so we're going to introduce death. You see, I had to believe those lies that I was being told because the truth was far too inconvenient. The truth would have meant that I may have had to make a different decision about my line of work, about what I was doing, and I didn't want to do that, and so I just continued to believe the lie. I kept speaking the lie. But I remember, I remember looking back up at the screen and seeing this, this instrument, this cannula, the suction wasn't turned on yet. I remember it, watching it go into the woman's uterus on the screen and, and I watched it go right up next to the side of this little boy and as it touched his side, he jumped. And he began flailing his arms and legs as if he were trying to move away from that abortion instrument, but there was nowhere for him to go. And the physician asked the technician to turn the suction on, and he said, beam me up, Scotty. And the suction was turned on. I think people make the assumption that what I saw next was the worst part, that seeing a child become dismembered in his mother's womb would be the worst part. But, I mean, that was bad, but I knew that was going to happen. That wasn't the worst part. You see, the worst part was that I just stood there. And I did nothing. I mean, I remember wanting to, to lean down and sit this woman up and say, look. Look what is happening to your child. Make them stop. But I didn't. I just stood there and I watched. After the screen went black, I knew that the abortion was complete. I went back to my office. I didn't, I didn't know what to think. I, I wasn't, didn't feel sad. I wasn't crying. I felt very numb. I felt shocked. And I felt very duped. And I felt so stupid. I thought all these years, all these lies, and I just blindly followed this organization without seeking truth. I didn't want to leave my job. I, my identity was wrapped up in the pro-choice movement. I didn't know who I was going to be if I wasn't this pro-choice champion. I did not want to leave my friends. All of my friends worked at Planned Parenthood. I did not want to leave my salary. I made a lot of money when I worked at Planned Parenthood. You know, they're a billion dollar nonprofit. That sounds weird, but 
because of that, we made really good money working at Planned Parenthood, and I didn't want to leave that behind. I mean, my husband was a teacher. <laughs> oh, you know how that goes. And um, so, you know, I, I mean, I didn't know what we were going to do. I didn't want to leave. And I kept trying to justify what I had seen over and over again in my head, but I just couldn't shake it. I couldn't make it okay in my mind. So Monday, I was sitting at my desk and I was watching these women come in and out of our facility and they were holding little brown paper bags. I knew that was their medication so that they could go home and self-abort their baby. I thought, I don't know what to do, but I said I wasn't going to do this anymore. I'm still sitting here in this office. And for eight years, there had been a group of people that had been praying outside of my abortion facility. I knew them. They knew me. And they had always said that if I ever wanted to leave my job, that they would help me. And so there in my office that day inside of Planned Parenthood, I just started praying probably for the first time in a long time, and I was just asking God to show me who to go to. I needed help, and I didn't know where to turn, and I kept feeling like he was telling me to go to those people that had been outside of my clinic, and I thought, no, give me somebody else. <laughs> Anybody else. <laughs> no, I just kept feeling I should go to them, and so I walked out the back door, I got in my car, could have walked because their office was conveniently located next door to our abortion clinic. Um, but I thought that would be suspicious, so I got in my car and drove the 50 yards and um, pulled up in their parking lot and called the number and there was a, a sweet woman that answered the phone and she said, Coalition for Life, this is Heather, how can I help you? And I said, hi Heather, this is Abby Johnson. So pause. And uh, I said, I'm in your parking lot and I would like to come in. Do you have a back door? <laughs> and she said, can you hold on just a moment? <laughs> and so about a minute later, she came back on the phone and she told me she'd meet me at the back door. And so I walked up to the back door and she opened the door and there was three of them standing there like this. <laughs> And after about a 20 second stare down, I finally asked if I could come in and talk with them and they said yes. And so I went in and I didn't know if I was going to be able to look them in the face and to say, you've been right and I've been wrong. I didn't know if I possessed that type of humility or whatever it is. But when I sat down and looked at them, that was really the only thing that I could say. I had been right. And they had, I had been wrong, and they had been right. And they could, I didn't know what they were gonna say because they could have very easily looked at me and said, that's great, um, but before we help you, we're gonna need a big old apology because you have not been nice to us. Uh, you turn the sprinklers on us when we're out there. You act like you're going to hit us every time you drive by. You are not a nice person, but you know what? They did it. They just looked at me, and it was over. That eight years, it was just, it was done. And I, I guess I realized then that that's probably the closest that I will ever understand the unconditional forgiveness and scandalous mercy of Christ here on earth. It, it was over. I didn't have to apologize because they didn't go out there to prove that they were right. They went out there to do the work of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't about them being right, it was about them being faithful. 
So I left that day not knowing what I was going to do, but the next day I called them and decided that, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do for work. I didn't know how we were going to pay bills, but I could not stay there anymore. And so October 6th was my last day with Planned Parenthood. I gave them, I don't know, about five minutes notice. Um, I fastened my my resignation. I left all my badges and keys and everything in my supervisor's box and I walked outside and one of the men that worked for the Coalition for Life, because we didn't know what it was going to be like when I told everybody that I was leaving and so he was a little, you know, they just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything ugly and, um, and that I made it out okay. And so he actually came out to the sidewalk that day just to watch and make sure everything went, went all right. And um, I got in my car, I loaded up all my stuff, I got in my car, I waved to him and told him that I had done it, that I had resigned. And I drove out of that parking lot for the last time. I remember taking a left and looking in my rearview mirror and I remember him just falling to his knees. I don't know why I'm getting emotional, I just had a baby. Um, <laughs> hormones. Um, I just remember him being on his knees with his hands up in the air and I just thought, they never thought this would happen. They never thought that I would leave. And here, I was leaving. You see, I'm standing up here as proof that conversion is possible for anyone. No one is beyond the power of conversion because no one is beyond the power of Christ. And I don't know about the God you serve, but the one I serve, he's, he's kind of in the business of miracles. It's what he does the best. And my life, my conversion, my parents will tell you it is nothing short of a miracle. And that's why we do this work. Nobody got into the pro-life movement. I can tell you, none of the women or men that work for this ministry thought, I'm going to work here because I have a real strong passion for giving out diapers. <laughs> so that's not why you get into the pro-life movement. That's not why you get into a ministry like this. You get into a ministry like this because you believe in the power of conversion through Christ. Because we know that every single woman that walks in the door He's on the verge of having a conversion to choose life. We pray for our politicians who do not align with us because we know that all it takes is God interceding one time. And conversion is possible. These women who, who are wracked with guilt because of past abortions in their life, and they don't feel like they can connect with Christ because their sin is too great. You see, we know that God is right there waiting for a conversion. We're pro-life because we believe in conversion. See, we're not here because we just want to make abortion illegal. We're here because we want to make abortion unthinkable. And what we're doing here is creating a paradigm shift in our culture, one from a culture of death to a culture of life. And all it takes is just one person to begin that paradigm shift. That one person reaches out to someone else. And that person reaches out to someone else. And look at what has happened in your community. So many lives saved. So many women transformed by the power of Christ. No one is beyond the power of conversion. And you know, I told you that the, the thing that I regret the most is that when I had the opportunity to intervene and save that one life, 
I stood there and I did nothing. I let my apathy take over my actions. And I am pleading with you tonight, don't let this opportunity pass you by. You have the opportunity tonight to partner with this Women's Center and to save lives, to bring about conversion, to bring the power of the gospel to women and men who desperately need it. Don't let this opportunity pass you by tonight. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to hold a baby that's been saved from abortion. But God has given me that moment several times. And I remember the first time it happened. I, well, I remember when I had my daughter. She was my first child. And I remember holding her for the first time. I remember looking at her perfect little face and just thinking, wow. Well, first I was thinking I want a sandwich. But then, <laughs> it was long labor. And then I got my sandwich. And then, I was thinking, wow. There's never going to be a moment more perfect than this one right here. But then I got to hold a little boy that was saved from abortion. I'm telling you, the first time I looked in his face, I thought, wow, this is even better. Because my daughter's life, my daughter was never scheduled to die. But this little boy, on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, was scheduled to be aborted. But because someone like you showed up to intervene, to speak life to this woman, God showed up. And when God shows up, lives are transformed. Don't let this moment tonight pass you by. This is not your pro-life activity for the year, y'all. This is just the beginning. This isn't it. It's a good start. But this isn't it. They need your time, they need your talents, and they need your treasure. The Bible says something like, I say this all the time, I should actually look it up, but um, <laughs> it says something like, uh, Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I gotta tell you, if I lived right here in this community, this is where my heart would be. And I'm encouraging you tonight to give of your time generously and to give of your treasure generously. We look at these children, we recognize that their lives are priceless, but the abortion industry looks at them and sees $450 on every one of their heads. We know better, and because we know better, we must do better. And I'm asking you to do better tonight and to do something. And I don't want you to feel discouraged. So many women seeking abortions in our country, and sometimes it can feel very overwhelming. But I want to encourage you tonight because people will come up to me and they'll say, Oh, Abby, we're, just, we're never going to win. I mean, look, they've got Bill Gates and Bill Clinton and stacks of bills. But I tell them, you know what? It doesn't matter who they have on their side. It doesn't matter how much money they have. Because we know that we've already won this victory. We have the number one guy on our side, and that's Jesus Christ. And we will win. Thank you so much, and God bless you.